thanks for that introduction, and I love speaking when people are trying to want to eat. <laughs> you get that? Trying to want to eat, because they're not bringing the food out, because they're waiting for me. So it's really a pleasure to be here um, with all of you tonight, and, and the amazing collection of local and state officials that have assembled here in the, with the key objective of talking about local solutions to climate change. I'll try to vibrate a little bit between national issues and local issues and, and, and hopefully spur us on a little bit, but I'm pretty confident that this group doesn't need to be spurred on too much. Um, I also want to thank our EPA regional offices, both one and two, um, for uh, sponsoring today, um, and uh, also the university for their um, great uh, effort to co-sponsor and, and bring us together. This is a, um, an amazing issue, uh, one that affects every one of us individually, our families, our children, um, and our children's children are gonna be affected by the things that we're talking about and trying to deal with today. You know, just two weeks ago, uh, on May 6th, the U.S. Global Climate Research Program, which is not EPA, it's not just government scientists, it's an accumulation of scientists throughout the United States that Congress has asked back in, far back as 1990, to do a quadrennial climate uh, science assessment. And we've skipped a couple of years in between, uh, this is, I think, the first time we've done it almost on a quadrennial pattern. I think it was like at five years. But I think it was a pretty stark reminder of, of the evolution of science over the last uh, several decades. And it certainly confirmed in the National Climate Assessment what kind of serious problem we're really facing. And it confirmed that, and I think this was the buzzword of two weeks ago, it is already affecting us. This is not something that is going to be here 50 years from now, although if we don't do anything, it will be with even more fervor than it is now. Uh, but it is something that's already affecting every region of the United States and every sector of the United States economy. And the study underscores the need to combat this threat and to build resilience because we're already feeling the effects, build resilience into American communities. And I'm pretty certain that this is the reason that you are all here today, because of that issue of how do we work together, how do we learn from each other about how to build resilience into our day-to-day -day work as government officials, as people in business, as people who just have a strong interest in, in how our communities grow and prosper. You know, the. The other thing about the climate assessment was the growing level of granularity that we're able to look at these issues. And some people think climate change is like this homogeneous thing that will happen. You know, it'll get two degrees warmer in the Sahara Desert and it'll get two degrees warmer in Antarctica. Well, that's not what's happening. Um, those of you who are into physics and chemistry understand that there's a volume of gases attached to the Earth by gravity. And those gases are being heated up and they're being heated up, let's say, a de one degree centigrade, and you calculate the volume of that gas and how much energy is put into that gas attached to the Earth by gravity by a one degree centigrade rise in temperature, and you can see how the tumult is created in the way those gases move around uh, the Earth. And so these challenges and how it affects us on Earth is is different depending on where you are. And we now see regional analysis in the United States, including regional analysis of New England and northeast part of the United States, sort of thinking from almost uh, where the United States capital is in Washington, D.C., all the way up to Maine. We see increasing vulnerability to heat waves. We see coastal and river flooding. And we see extreme weather uh, on the rise and expected to continue, including intense rain events. I was just looking at the model out here of how you can model um, in, in a little more intense rain events and what happens to the, and I know I wanted to say this in this speech tonight, fluvial geomorphology. <laughs> it's not in my official talking points. But if I can say that in evapotranspiration in one evening, I'm really excited. <laughs> 
So, and in, in New England, obviously, we have quite a few people living in urbanized area. In fact, about 50% of the people in New England live in urbanized areas or near the coast, near the coast. And during the coast, along the coast of this part of the country, we have a long standing and complex network of infrastructure, rail lines, pipelines, highways, wastewater plants, drinking water plants, subways, trucking routes, uh, airports. All of, can anybody think, just think for a second, of any of that long-standing northeast infrastructure that might be in harm's way due to, um, just might be in harm's way due to uh, more intense coastal storms, uh, higher um, uh, tidal surges, or or uh, sewer overflows and things of that nature. It's easy for you to figure out how sea level rise and coastal flooding and intense pre precipitation is going to have an effect on this infrastructure that we rely on. Those of us who live in the Northeast United States, we rely on this network, which has long established and been here for a long time. You know, we have more intense storms. You know, these storms we've been having over the last couple of weeks are not nor'easters. They're not hurricanes. They're just the normal mid-latitude cyclonic events that happen all year long, but they're coming through with, with tornadoes in the Midwest and intense precipitation here. I think we had four inches of rain on Friday, on Thursday night in uh, Washington, D.C. And, you know, the Potomac River was right at its, right at bank full. Um, you know, so we're just right at that edge, right there in the, in the, in the District of Columbia. And then I, I think many of us, uh, you know, obviously either personally have been experiencing or, or know people who were involved with or affected by uh, so-called Superstorm Sandy. And, you know, in the New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania area, not to mention the, what happened further to the north in, in New England, the cost to the American economy was $65 billion from that one event. And, it's interesting, I never could really figure out why they call it a superstorm. It was just really big. <laughs> it was really big. And um, I spent that night, as it was happening, trying to figure out how to move gasoline around the east coast of the United States. Because, you know, the, everything was just out everywhere. We were barging stuff up from Baltimore into the New York, into the New York Harbor. And um, I'll just say this. That was a category one. So the cost of inaction are mounting, and, and, we're, and we're already paying the price. We're already paying for what's going on. So when people say, oh, EPA might be doing a, a rule or a regulation on the mitigation side that might cost a couple of billion dollars, that one event was $65 billion. You know, in 2012 we, uh, alone, we had 11 events that totaled $110 billion of damage in the United States, 11 weather events. And the cost of rebuilding is, 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 is a lot. And, and we're learning right now why we're sitting in this room in recovery from Sandy in Long Island and New Jersey on how we rebuild not the same way it was. And we're struggling mightily with our existing laws between FEMA and EPA and Housing and Urban Development, Department of Transportation. How do we get things to be different so the next time it comes, which it will, we'll be better prepared and the damage will be less. Um, you know, the severe weather we had this winter, people talk about the uh, cold weather we had, and they say, how could there be global climate change? Um, actually, let me say, re rephrase that. How could there be global warming? It, because there's, look how cold it is in, in New England and Chicago. And, and I, I had somebody in my office, I think it was like whenever the polar vortex started. Um, and you could feel it coming, couldn't you? <laughs> um, when the polar vortex started, it was minus 12 degrees in Chicago at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And somebody says, see, this is not global warming. I said, well, come here, come and look at my uh, uh, weather. Anybody know what weather underground is? It's what I, I look at all the time. So I zipped on my wonder map and, and went up to Barrow, Alaska. Anybody know where that is, right? It's above the Arctic Circle. And in fact, in January, it's dark 24 hours a day at Barrow, Alaska. It was six degrees below zero. 
six degrees below zero in Barrow, which is normally about 50 below, and in Chicago is minus 12. I said, what more evidence do you need? Of course it's cold in Chicago, but look what's happening. This is one of the warmest years for Alaska. They, the Iditarod, if you guys know that dog race, they had to truck the sleds a couple of, couple of different lengths of the race because there wasn't enough snow. So, you know, climate change is not some uniform kind of thing that's happening. It's creating more chaos almost in, in the weather systems on, on Earth. And we're all here today because we know we have to plan ahead. We know that this is what's happening. We know the kinds of things we need to expect, and we know we have to plan ahead. We have to plan ahead for intense storms. We have to plan ahead for extreme weather, and we have to understand what that means to our day-to-day -day work and how, do we be, how are we ready for when the next one or next event comes. And the key, the key which is represented by everybody here in this room is that we can't do, none of us can do this alone. No town can do this alone. No federal agency can do this alone. The only way we as a country can be better prepared for the citizens who depend on us is if we work together. And that's got to be one of the clarion calls out of this group, is that we need to work together. We need to break the barriers down. We need to understand how our programs can be meshed to make the kind of progress we need to make. Now let me talk about the President's action plan a minute. You know, last year in June, not quite a year ago, the President, um, in a speech, released his climate action plan. And of course, EPA has a starring role in that plan, but by no means are we the only uh, one involved. And there were three big parts to that plan. It's many pages long, and there's lots of other documents behind it, but think of three things. Number one, let's try to start getting serious about mitigating this problem. What can we do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And this is where EPA plays a very dominant but not exclusive role. Um, the second part is how do we provide climate preparedness? Because we know it's going to happen, and it is happening, and we're going to have effects, no matter how fast we can go on the mitigation. And the third, and I think this is important and not to lose sight on, even though it's not the major subject here, is that as we are strong and deliberate in our domestic policy in the United States, leverage that from a moral high ground on international negotiations to get the rest of the world to come along, including the major uh, developing parts of the world that are really growing in greenhouse gases. I think everybody here probably knows that China now beats the United States in greenhouse gas emissions but are vitally interested in also the impact on their people of the pollution that's coming with it. And as we're in a moment, perhaps, between now and Paris next year, where we could, in theory, uh, find a global solution. But the United States needs to go into those conversations with the wind in its sails that it is taking action domestically to deal with its own issues. You know, the, um, Following up on that, the President issued, and this is more germane directly to the work we're doing here, in November of last year, issued an executive order on climate preparedness and resilience. And uh, that was also taking a multi-pronged approach um, in addition to the mitigation uh, program of how we work with state and local governments. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the work that's been set up part of that, but I want to digress for a few more moments on on mitigation so you have a sense of some of the things that are, that are going on. In a couple of weeks, EPA will issue its draft regulations on existing power plants and greenhouse gas emissions from electric generating in the United States, generation in the United States. And that will be a draft. It will be a proposal. And it will be carbon pollution standards for existing power generators. Um, that will require a a lengthy, I'm going to prognosticate here, a lengthy period of comment. <laughs> um, this is a wild guess on my part. Um, and and high-level interaction with the United States Congress. Um, the, the, the result will be, at some time in about ne in next winter, we will work on the, on the final rule. But the beauty part of this particular proposal is that 
it requires us to listen to a lot of different people. We've listened to states. We've listened to local governments. We've listened to industry. We've listened to the, uh, the different parts of the electric generating sector. And that proposal is now actually undergoing interagency review at the, at the federal level. And there's a couple of things that we heard in all those sessions that we had that are pretty important. One is that this needs to have some flexibility into it because we have to not only have the New England Reggie program be able to be not undermined and incorporated and, and embraced and California's uh, cap and trade program, but we also have to have Kentucky be able to do something. So that's the span of the kind of work that we're doing at EPA and the kind of listening we're doing because the next step after we finalize it next winter will be the states have to do their plan. And it's a system of emission reductions under this section of the law. And under a systems approach, you have a potentially a lot of flexibility in perhaps how we set what the standard and goal would be, but also you have a lot of flexibility in how the states would put their plans together. So flexibility, pragmatic, we have, to, we have to have our eye on things like reliability and make sure that everybody continues to have electricity, that we have time frames in there that enable everybody to get this work done, um, and that you know, there are many other public health benefits to what we're talking about by reducing carbon pollution. And so this is going to be one of the most substantial undertakings that EPA has ever done. And I don't want you guys to think it's an underestimation on my part on that, because it is a lot of work, and it's going to take a lot of uh, energy, if I could use that term, to get, it, to get it done. But it is going to be one of the most interesting things this country has ever done if we pull it off, because the dynamic between local, business, states, federal, to get these plans done and to keep the downward trajectory, which we are on in this country, of greenhouse gas emissions going in the right direction, so that we have that moral high ground I was talking about, is going to require the psychic energy of just about everybody who's into it. So, um, and we don't have to sacrifice economic activity for this. Our, our analysis is going to look at the economic activity, but I can guarantee you this, when you start looking at all the different things you can do to reduce electric uh, emissions from electric generation, you're going to be looking at things that are going to generate jobs and generate a lot of opportunity. And, and that's what we need to keep our eye on. And states will have a lot of flexibility on how they figure out how that crafted to their states within the guidelines of the overall best system. Now, I want to point very briefly to what EPA was able to do working with our partners at the Department of Transportation just two years ago when we did the, the rule, finalized the rule, that will make the average automobile in 2025 be 54 miles per gallon. That's a doubling of fuel economy over that period of time. And if you work the other way, it's a halving of the amount of greenhouse gas emissions from light-duty vehicles. And by light-duty, I mean all the way up to 10,000-pound SUVs. So by 2025, we will cut the new cars being sold. We'll have cut those emissions in half. And what's happening to the automobile industry right now? The supply chain is gearing up to supply the new kinds of technologies that cars need. Cars are starting to put those technologies in the cars faster than we anticipated. Last year, the automobile industry beat the numbers. Aggregately, there are some companies that were behind and some that were farther ahead, but aggregately, the, the industry beat the next year's numbers. And the supply chain of providers and the automobile industry itself has been hiring people to build these new technology cars. And guess what? Consumer demand is starting to change to be interested in high technology cars, cars that perform really well, and cars that get better fuel economy. And uh, I make no mistake about it, the trucking industry is right behind in that, in that way. So here we have a situation where, and, and this is the punchline to the cars, is if you reduce the amount of gasoline by half that you need, guess who also saves money? I know this is really fun. <laughs> Every family in America. <laughs> so all that hurt.
So while we're very engaged in the mitigation side at EPA, I want you to know we're deep into working with everybody on, on the adaptation and preparedness side. And obviously, uh, we're showing that by being here with you tonight and the work we're doing. And I think there's no better place in the country to be talking about this than in New England, because the spirit of collaboration here is like in your DNA. And this is the exactly, this conference is exactly the kind of thing that the president envisioned when he did his executive order on resilience and told us to really get together and work. In fact, in New England, you're so focused on this that seven days after the president issued that executive order, you were having a summit on climate preparedness, which <laughs> I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Who did that? Somebody must have had the inside scoop. Um, but that summit, which you're going to be talking about here, brought together the local, state, and private sector and environmental leaders to talk about what communities could do to become more resilient. It laid the groundwork. And things like data sharing, infrastructure needs, vulnerability assessments, resilience planning. Um, you know, as it was mentioned in my introduction, I spent a little, 11 years of my life as a local city planner. And I did do the floodplain plan for the city of Baltimore so that it can remain. I think somebody from Baltimore is here. At least I, there you go. <laughs> well, I did the Jones Falls flood plan to, so that city could be eligible for flood insurance. And now I love going to the Woodbury kitchen, which is in a flood safe spot. <laughs> in an old mill. In, the, in, the, in what was formerly known as the floodplain of the Jones Falls. So um, uh, a lot of, of great work gets done at the local level, and um, it's, really, uh, it's really important. And what you guys learned in the summit and what you're going to learn here is going to be really important for the national effort. Um, and you'll hear some more about that summit tomorrow afternoon. I think there's going to be a presentation at lunch tomorrow on the summit itself and some of the other, some of the other um, examples. But another big example of, of following up, obviously, on what the president asked is the actual task force that the president set up. And Governor Shumlin is part of that from Vermont. And um, that task force is looking at how to, it's local and state and tribal representatives. I was with them at their meeting in Des Moines, Iowa last week. They've had one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, and as they say in Iowa, one in the heartland. Um, and um, believe me, the heartland is affected by this. We're talking about intense rain events, coastal flooding, tidal surges. The heartland's talking about drought and lack of precipitation or distri distributional issues with precipitation. And in some parts of the Midwest and Western Midwest and up into the, into the steep of uh, the step of um, the Rocky Mountains, insect infestations, uh, all which are uh, enabled by different uh, climate conditions. But that task force is one that we're going to be looking for in the federal government on how we can do a better job. And some of the ideas uh, that are going to be brought to that task force are ideas that the task force members bring. And so I would imagine that the governor um, would be able to bring uh, stories about Tropical Storm Irene and what's been going on in Vermont and how some of the issues of taking a holistic approach to rebuilding, as I was just mentioning earlier, in terms of remodeling and how towns can look at their future and how infrastructure can be protected and how they work in cooperation with the federal agencies and the state agencies, which you got the Department of Economic and Housing and Community Development in Vermont working with EPA and FEMA and other go local governments and, and NGOs in order to look at the needs in, uh, for, from uh, in the Mad River Valley and from after, in the aftermath of Irene. Um, EPA's Smart Growth Program provided some funding to help look at some of the issues there steering and some of the ideas that have come out have been steering new development away from vulnerable areas, conserving floodplains, you know, just like the Jones Falls. Um, the um, protecting historic downtowns, this is, you know, obviously the iconic New England is to do that. And, and this 
example in the, in the Mad River Valley is, is something that conveys the complexity of the problem we're dealing with, but also the hope that people can come together and look at that future and see that future to be embracing the qualities and the soul of what the community is, but also to do it in a way that uh, reduces its, its uh, danger in the future. And so they'll be better prepared the next time and hopefully even better prepared and better prepared. You know, we've looked at e in EPA at things like cost, things like green infrastructure. Does everybody here know what green infrastructure is? Do I need to do a digression here for 20 minutes? <laughs> oh, I know, you guys want to eat. Um, so green infrastructure is obviously trying to mimic the natural um, hydrology in, a, um, in an urbanized, a more urbanized area. The, um, and, you know, we've done some analysis at EPA that shows that we could almost reduce 50% of flood damage just by doing green infrastructure. So there's a lot of work to be done there that also creates a, 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 an amenity in communities when you do green infrastructure. So the task force is going to be looking at natural solutions and natural, national, I'm sorry, natural too, national ideas. But the governor will be able to bring New England ideas to that task force to be incorporated into the national, and some of that will come from the conversations you guys are having here. Uh, so part of the message today is we got to keep this conversation going. We have to understand these vulnerabilities, and we have to develop new tools and new integrating ideas on how to move forward. You know, the integration means that we have to build some of this stuff into our everyday work whether it's subdivision regulations or highway renewals or st stormwater and wastewater treatment plant upgrades, that needs to be done with a different mindset in the future. And everybody has to be involved with that. You know, even here in New Hampshire, um, our communities are, are trying to deal with um, this whole issue of adaptation and adaptation planning and how you build it into cities' everyday operation. Communities like Akeen and, and Portsmouth are both looking at um, their vulnerabilities and how they can prepare accordingly. And, and in Keene, they are setting up goals to integrate and incorporate sustainability and green buildings into their, I know we have people from that town here. <laughs> There's a few, council members perhaps. <laughs> um, um, you know, building it into building codes, energy codes, reducing sprawl, improving design and reconstruct roadways to handle the changes in temperature and precipitation, and deal with stormwater issues in the built environment. These are, these are pretty important steps, and that's, that's going on already here, and people are starting to think about this. At EPA, we're a federal agency. What, what do we know about paving a road? Um, not much. Um, <laughs> So, but what, it, what, are, what is it that we are doing? Um, well, we're looking at our programs, and we look at our programs like contaminated sites that we're trying to clean up. We look at our programs like air pollution control and what happens if the temperature is on average higher. Does that increase or decrease the ozone? Who knows the answer to that question? Increases, right? Up, oh, everybody's pointing up, right. So. You know, siting wastewater plants or, or reconstructing storm drains and, and combined sewer overflows. All of these things require us to be taking this into account when we're talking to folks about their permits, when we're talking to them about judicially supervised consent orders, all these things that we do at EPA, we have to build them into, including how the SRFs, the state revolving funds, are, are used and what kind of conditions we look at. We need to be integrating these conditions and these ideas into our programs. And this needs to be transmitted to our regional offices and to our different program offices. So the other thing EPA is doing, which I think is pretty important to all these things, is we're trying to, you know, here's where you get the economy of scale. We're trying to build tools, tools that can help local governments and states do the planning that they need to do. We're working, for instance, on a stormwater calculator that we've put out that's almost a site level thing that has a climate change component to it. We're looking at our bigger wastewater and water modeling efforts and how we can transform them to take into account green infrastructure and changing precipitation patterns. 
We are, we've developed an Enviro Atlas, which is a geographic-based set of information that you can use in any town, in any county, in every city in the country to look at what kind of information already exists there. We're, these are designed to help local decision makers, not to make decisions, but to provide information from our, uh, from our experience and our ability to build these models so that you have the ability to make the decisions locally. Um, this is a pretty important economy of scale, so everybody doesn't have to create their own model. We can create one that we could all use, and we already have some of them that are out there. And these things are going to be pretty important. So I'm going to close by saying a couple of key points that I think you've already picked up on, that um, we can't, as a country, be better prepared for the impacts of climate change that we are having and are going to have, no matter how fast we go on mitigation projects, without local governments intensely involved and telling us how to help, because we cannot do it from some magical uh, national uh, perch or, or, or pedestal. We need your help in identifying the challenges that you are facing so that we can work them into our programs that, that can help in some way. We need to deliver to you a coordinated federal family that can help you deal with the issues that you are dealing with. And we all need to make data available to people so that people understand what the risks are, they understand what's going on, and they understand what they can do even personally to help do some of the resilience planning and mitigation. You know, in the Northeast, if you own a home or if you're in an apartment complex, there are things you can do, whether it's on the mitigation side by being more energy efficient, which then demands less electricity, which then makes the electricity plant generator run less, which reduces the pollution from it. You can also um, put a rain garden in or a rain barrel to help with intense storms so you hold some of the water uh, back from running off more quickly. Um, there's a lot that can be done from the individual to the municipal to the state, but we want to be working with you and delivering a, an e a federal family of ideas and, and tools and, and, and where we can, you know, we're constrained also, financial assistance, even if it's seed money to do a plan uh, that can help. So it's imperative, the Im it's imperative that we build a new era in this country of partnership to be prepared for the impacts of climate change. And so that's my main message to all of you, and I couldn't be happier that you're all meeting together to, to build that new era of partnership between state, local, and federal government. So thank you for inviting me tonight, and enjoy your dinner. But, but wait, there's more. Um, those of you who haven't visited the EPA booth, I think that's where these cards are, EPA booth, yes? So um, this card is uh, contact names, tell us what you're doing, what information could help you, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. If you can see these little cards at the EPA booth, which last time I looked is right, right about behind that screen on the other side of the wall there. Um, it would be really helpful to us to understand what some, it's a real simple one to do. So I'll, questions, if you guys have time, I'm, do a few. Yeah, uh, thanks, thank you very much. Uh, one, one quick question. Um, I was interested in what you said about the, uh, um, the moral standing of the U.S. Um, and uh, with regards to um, carbon emissions and all of that. And I know that we're all aware that we're a country of, of where 5% of the population is emitting 30% uh, of the emissions. And uh, maybe also to add to that, just to say that the average American lifestyle is um, uh, five times the, the carbon footprint. I'm wondering if, if you feel that those aspects of the overall American picture are something that impacts our, uh, our um, moral, moral standing world, in this world. World image? Or, or, or just the moral, moral yeah. aspects of all of that. Of, of, of course it does. Everything we, do, everything we do in this country you know, affects our image. But what, I, what I'm talking about 
and, and, and for the first time um, ever, you know, in the last hundred years, the United States carbon em or greenhouse gas emissions are going down. And any time before, regardless of what people think about our lifestyle, um, which, you know, runs the gamut, um, we can't even get in the room to have a real conversation, in my opinion. I've been to some of these international negotiations. Um, if we're going in there with our emissions continue going up saying, and us saying how good it's going to be if everybody just agrees to go along with it, we, we have to go in at least with the change in direction, which we currently have and which we need to continue to work on to continue it going in, in that direction. Um, we have to show some commitment that even with the lifestyle we have, that the resources we use can be more, um, more stewarded. We, we can be better stewards of the resources we have and how we use them, and we can, we can do our part to, to contribute to the global issue. And I, I think that that's what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, we, that's not the only thing that affects people's image of the United States, and I think your point is well taken. But, but we can't even start if we're not going down or putting in place policies that are going to have dramatic changes. And some of the stuff that we're doing now is got, at least it's not the stuff that we need to do by the end of the century or the middle of the century, but it's certainly stuff that moves us in a trajectory that we have not been on before. Um, so a couple times you mentioned the coordinated federal family, and um, I think there's some amazing programs going on among many of our federal agencies, and I'm curious how you envision us on the ground and the federal agencies, how can we do a better job at coordinating all of these initiatives? So I do a program with the CDC on health and climate change, and we have EPA grants funding climate change and NOAA doing amazing work, and you mentioned some of the tools that EPA is putting out. How can we work together to prevent duplication of some of the efforts and encourage better coordination to strengthen the initiatives we have yeah. going on? Yeah, it, it, to me, it's, all, I, I mean, there's a, that's a mystical question to a certain extent, but, but the other way I could say it is how can we not? So we, we, we you know, you're obviously, this group, I would hope, in terms of ideas you come up with or recommendations you make that that the governor may bring to the national conference, the national uh, task force, or or that some of you may be able to input directly to that, there has to be a constant push to improve that. And there's no miracle cure, but um, you know EPA and HUD and DOT formed a coalition about four years ago uh, called the Sustainable Communities uh, 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 Group, and and we've down an MOU and, you know, DOT and HUD folks sit in and think about EPA grants. We sit in when they're doing their TIGER grants and we look at these things together. But, um, and now with uh, Hurricane Sandy recovery, you know, we're going sewage treatment plant by sewage treatment plant, trying to find a way to mix and match all the different funding sources to get the maximum result to a better future. So we're learning. And if you look at the report that the work group Put that the president put together that was chaired by Sean Donovan, the secretary of HUD. If you look at that report to the president, it's replete with a whole bunch of ideas on how we can improve these federal coordinations. I, I think almost everybody in the federal government needs, knows we need to do that. And so um, I think the, the extent you guys can keep pushing us in that direction and to the extent that we hear your call is going to just help us continue to improve. So um, there's no way to get there if we don't do that. So I appreciate the question. It's the right question among many others. Um, and it's we just need to keep pushing in that direction. It's, I think it's better than it was two years ago. And hopefully two years from now, it'll be a lot better. Uh, just as a follow up on the um, moral and uh, high ground, if you will. When you look at the data on U.S. companies or the U.S. going down, it's, oh, I agree with you, it couldn't be more important. Do we also consider the impact of our companies overseas in terms of what they're doing there? Um, I, I think 
um, we have to do that, but I, what I was talking about is just emissions being generated in, in country. Um, you know, I'm trying to start somewhere. You know, it's positive. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and, you know, um, my, my view is that in order for us to have the kind of national policies we need to really get us where we need to go toward the middle of the century, we, ha we have to build confidence in our own selves in this country that we can do this. And, you know, there's a lot of doubt seeding for the science, and there's equal doubt seeding for whether the country can rise to this occasion without, quote unquote, you know, crippling itself forever. Um, and I think all of that is not true. I mean, th th this is like one of the biggest economic opportunities that has existed in a long time, and, and I think many, many companies do see that. So this confidence building is what we're in right now. Can we do the automobiles? Can we cut the emissions in half and still have a vibrant automobile industry and personal transportation? You know, we're not all taking bicycles everywhere, although I personally like to do that. So. Um, I, I believe that there's a confidence building process that's going on right now, and I think part of the work that EPA is doing and, and part of the success the country has in implementing some of these programs, whether it's the cars or the power plants, will demonstrate that these are doable things and that positive things happen. So I'm feeling like not only do we have to keep going in this with this trajectory and, and capitalizing, it, capitalizing on it to bring, because obviously even if we eliminate the United States emissions on greenhouse gases, which won't be happening soon. Um, you know, the rest of the world is quickly consuming that, that, that volume, so we have to find a way to bring them along and do it in a way that captures their imagination that it doesn't mean they're second-class citizens. It means that they're going to be in a modern world that they can do this and, and still have a quality of life for their citizens. So I, I, it's doable. But you're right, these are big challenges. Both of you have raised significant challenges. I'm glad I'm not in the State Department. <laughs> <laughs>